Kia ora koutou, ko Tiffany Taku Ingwa, he kairuruku tau whainga a hau ki Manaki Whenua. Good morning everyone, my name is Tiffany and I am the events coordinator at Manaki Whenua Land Care Research. Before I hand over to Christine, I'm going to run through a couple of technical slides to ensure that your experience with us online today goes as smooth as possible. If you have joined us previously for a Link Online session, you can ignore me for the next minute. You will notice you have a control panel at the side of your screen. If at any time this collapses, you can bring it back by simply clicking the orange arrow button. If you are having sound issues and you can see my mouth moving but cannot hear a word I'm saying, please grab the PDF in the handout section and this has instructions to resolve this quickly. The audio panel is where you can control where the sound plays on your computer. Select the drop down arrow and choose your audio output. During the presentation, you may have questions that you want to be covered in our Q&A session. You can do this via the chat panel throughout our session today. You will notice it is pretty small and it will be hard to read other attendees' questions. Select the pop-out icon on this panel and drag the corner out to make it as big as you want. You can also use this feature if you are having technical issues and ask me any questions. Questions asked by the audience show as anonymous and a green colour in the chat panel. If I respond to you regarding a question, this will show as red. Now over to Christine to introduce you to our Link Online session. Kia ora and uh, thank you for joining us uh, on this sunny morning. It's great to be able to share these insights from the Survey of Rural Decision Makers with you. You're going to love this presentation, but I do want to remind you that this is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of uh, what we have in the Survey of Rural Decision Makers will probably pique your curiosity and we will include a link to the full survey summary information that's on our website in the email that you receive after the presentation. I'm going to hand over to Pike Brown. Pike is our Principal Economist and the Director of the survey. I'll be back to help with questions, so don't forget to put them in the chat box as soon as you're ready. Over to you, Pike. Tēnā koutou katoa, ko Pike Speak te mona, ko East River te awa, no New York ho, ko Pike Stronger Brown, toko inoa. Thank you for coming today. I'm delighted that there's so many people tuning in. This is going to be quite a short seminar, so I won't be able to cover everything that we've learned about forestry or tree planting, not by a long way. Um, but instead, what I'm going to try to do is to offer an introduction to the Survey of Rural Decision Makers to show a few results and then invite you to start a conversation about some of your specific interests. Now, there's going to be quite a few um, logos in the presentation, but I'd like to highlight three of them right up front. MPI, MFE, and MB have all been steadfast backers of the survey of decision, uh, rural decision makers since its beginning, and this work would not have been possible without them. The survey of rural decision makers began in 2013 when we were commissioned to survey dairy farmers in the Waikato, Canterbury, and Southland. Minaki Fenua recognized the opportunity to better understand decision making, not only in those three regions, but across all of rural New Zealand. We also strove to be inclusive, covering farmers and foresters and growers, essentially the totality of primary industry. And in developing the questionnaire, we relied on industry partners to help us identify key knowledge gaps. There's also been a great deal of input from central and regional governments, especially MPI and MFE, as well as farmers and foresters and growers themselves. We've also consulted widely with scientists across New Zealand, both at CRIs and at universities to help uh, with the survey design. At this point, I've lost track of how many people have contributed to the questionnaire but it's certainly well north of, of 100 New Zealanders. Gratifyingly, there's also been quite a lot of, of interest in the outputs as well. Uh, and here are some of the logos of the organizations that I'm aware of having used the data. These include central government, most of the regional councils, half of the CRIs, two national science challenges, most New Zealand universities, and several international universities as well. When we designed the survey initially, 
it was meant to be taken on a computer, but since then uh, it's been optimized for mobile devices. In fact, about a third of respondents now complete the survey either on a phone or on an, on an iPad or tablet. There's a lot of advantages to electronic enumeration. For me, the most important one is survey logic or branching, which means that you, you get a question that depends on your answers to previous questions. Let me give you an example of what that looks like. Respondents who had any land planted in forestry were asked when that land was planted. And if their forest was planted prior to 1990, the next question they see is whether they seek expert advice with respect to genetics, management, planning, harvest, or marketing. If on the other hand, the, the forest was planted after 1989, then the next question they see is whether they're registered in the emissions trading scheme. If not, then they see the same questions, they see the same questions about the advice. But if they are registered in the ETS, then they're asked questions about those same topics as well as advice related to the ETS. And these respondents then see other questions related to the ETS before everybody sees uh, the next comment, the next question in common. Now, the survey covers a few of the topics that other surveys of farmers, foresters, and growers covers, especially ownership, location, sector, and land use. But as you can see from the list of high level topics that we've covered since 2013, the Survey of Rural Decision Makers also covers topics such as management practices and technology adoption, conservation practices and pest management, natural disasters, climate change resilience, values such as risk preferences and time preferences and farming networks. It also covers objectives and profitability, future planning, generations that they've been on the land and community involvement. In short, what we try to do with the Survey of Rural Decision Makers is to go beyond the what and where of rural land use to cover the why, the when, and the how. Now, not every topic is included in every wave of the survey. So for example, the red topics were not included in 2019, but others were added in in 2019, and tree planting is a good example of that. Many of the topics have been there since the survey began, giving us the ability to look at trends over time. The 2013 survey had 237 questions and 1,500 responses. By 2015, this grew to 2,800 responses. In 2017, it was 237 questions and 4,500 responses. And in 2019, it was 336 questions and 3,750 responses. Now, importantly, many more than uh, 1,600 respondents in 2019 also completed the survey in 2017 which means that we can use the 2017 results as a baseline for assessing attitudes and behaviors over time, which I think is quite exciting. So are these numbers big or are they small? Well, according to Statistics New Zealand, there's about 50,000 commercial farms, forests, and growing operations in the country. And MPI's best estimate is that there's about 140,000 lifestyle blocks. So based on these numbers, we cover 3.5% of commercial operations and 1.4% of of lifestyle blocks. In comparison, we can look at things like the ANZ Business Outlook Survey, which has 400 firms and there are 528,000 business enterprises, uh, according to StatsNZ, and so that's a, a coverage of 0.08%. We could look at something like the General Social uh, Survey, which is run by StatsNZ, and they survey 8,000 people out of 4.9 million Kiwis or 0.02%. So while we're far from a census, we get a much larger share of the target population than most surveys do. And the reason that we're able to reach as many people as we do is because of industry partners who embrace science for the public good. And in this regard, I'd especially like to acknowledge Nate, the Forest Owners Association and the New Zealand Farm Forestry Association for partnering with us. Okay. So with that background, I'm gonna start showing some results from the survey. I'll begin with results from forestry and then move on to results for tree planting. The first question relevant for us today is whether respondents have any forestry on their properties. And forestry here is defined as any exotic plantation or uh, native plantations that are either intended for, uh, for harvest of timber or non-timber forest products. So overall, about 21% of our respondents have forestry on their properties. Um, 
this is not a, a true average because we oversample um, dairy, deer, and arable industries, and we undersample fruit and vegetable growers. Sheep and beef and forestry are in the same proportion as they are in the ag census. But this gives you a sense that overall about 21% of uh, enterprises have forestry. And not surprisingly, the vast majority of exotic forestry is comprised of radiata pine. And this is regardless of industry. And incidentally, it's also regardless of the region. Even uh, in the far south, it's mostly radiata. This slide shows when commercial forestry was planted by industry, whether it's pre-1990 or post-1989. And the critical difference is that enrollment in the emissions trading scheme is optional for forests planted after 1989. So this slide is telling us that among sheep and beef farmers with commercial forestry, 57% have pre-1990 forests and 86% have post-1989 forests. And overall, most commercial forests, not necessarily by land area, but by land owner, are post-1989 when enrollment in the ETS was optional. So then we ask the question, um, is all or part of your forest registered in the emissions trading scheme? And overall, about a quarter of respondents who had that option chose to enroll in the ETS. We then asked people whether they obtained expert advice with respect to forest management, uh, timber harvest marketing, matching genetics, and uh, forest engineering. And here you can see that only about a third of people with com commercial forestry seek advice on genetics, while about two thirds seek advice on timber harvest. And in comparison, when we ask people who are participating in the ETS whether they seek advice on that, you can see that about three fourths of those enrolled in the ETS seek expert advice on managing their participation. This slide shows how many days it takes to manage ETS compliance over the course of a year. And over three fourths of respondents say it's between one and seven person days per year. 13% report spending less than one day per year and 11% report spending more than eight person days per year. Now we report on how well uh, respondents understand the ETS. The top panel here shows the results uh, for those who are ETS registered. And the bottom shows results for those who are not. The histograms show the range of responses. So when the answer is zero, that means that they're not at all uh, confident that they understand the ETS. If they show a 10, report a 10, that means that they, are, they understand the ETS extremely well. Now, the optimistic way of reading these figures is that people who are enrolled understand the ETS much better than those who don't. The pessimistic view is that the vast majority of people understand the ETS less well than we might like. This slide shows um, when respondents with commercial forestry will harvest, and it shows the results by region rather than by industry. The thing that stands out for me most on this slide is the results for the West Coast, where you'll see that almost half of respondents plan to harvest within the next two years, and this is more than any other region. We asked, do you plan to currently we plant after harvesting. And again, if we look at the West Coast results, a um, large number of people are saying that they don't plan to replant or they're unsure. And so this suggests that we may look, be looking at some land use change away from forestry, at least in some locations. In the final slide on this section, I'm gonna look at intentions to add commercial forestry as a new enterprise or to add additional land to existing commercial forestry. So if you look on the left panel, only 5.7% of respondents intend to add commercial forestry as a new land in the, in the next decade. And among these, the majority of people plan to do so in the next couple of years. The right panel shows that only 3.9% of people with existing commercial forestry incre intend to increase the total area, the size of their forest. And among those who do, the majority plan to do so in the next two years. Okay, so um, with that, I'm gonna start focusing uh, more on tree planting. And the first result I'd like to share is whether people have increased tree planting in the recent past and whether they plan to increase tree planting in the near future. And I'm gonna go back to, to presenting results by industry because there's been so much media attention 
about uh, conversions of sheep and beef farms to forestry. So as you can see from this figure, the green and orange indicate those who plan to plant trees in the next two years. Orange means that they also planted in the last 10 years and green means that they didn't plant in the last 10 years. And the interesting result for me here is that there's virtually no difference between sheep and beef farmers and dairy farmers or deer farmers for that matter. This doesn't mean that there won't be big conversions, but this result doesn't seem entirely consistent with some of the media reports from the last year or so. Now, for people who planted trees in the last 10 years, we asked them what was the motivation for that, and this is what they told us. Uh, we're just focusing on sheep and beef farmers and dairy farmers here. And you can see that the main reasons that people gave were aesthetics and livestock control, habitat for biodiversity, water quality, cultural values, erosion control, future harvest, and kaitiaki. Incentives and financial support ranked quite far down on that list looking back over the last 10 years. What about people intending to plant trees over the next two years? Well, the same main categories emerge, although cultural values have risen in importance and offsetting farm emissions has also become more important, especially for dairy farmers. Potential for future harvest has fallen a bit and incentives are starting to show as a driver for this decision. In the next slide, we ask people to identify the single most important driver of their decision to plant trees in the next two years. And this is what they had to say. The main reasons are aesthetics, biodiversity, livestock health, and kaitiaki. Incentives such as funding under the One Billion Trees program are much further down on the list. You can see here that it's not registering at all for dairy farmers, and that it was only the most important reason for sheep and beef farmers for 1.3% for of respondents. We also asked people who don't plan to plant trees in the near future whether they had land that could accommodate tree planting. So that is, it, uh, could you plant trees if you wanted to? And overall, about half of them said yes. So then the next logical question is, why aren't you planting? And the overwhelming people that pe the overwhelming reason that people gave us is that there's better uses for the land, and fair enough. The second most reason given was expense and financial barriers. This suggests a role for funding under programs like the One Billion Trees program, and also for making sure that landowners are aware of the financial support. In addition to that, um, sheep and beef farmers are much more likely to report that negative perceptions about trees are preventing them from planting, a result that's very consistent with the, the news media over the last year. And that's much less of an issue for dairy farmers. Finally, for people who intend to plant trees, we asked, um, we asked what types of trees they plan to plant. And natives are the most popular choice by a wide margin. And interestingly, it's not all Manuka, it's, it's a mix of natives. Uh, and if we look at just the results for sheep and beef farms, you can see that in fact, on sheep and beef farms, natives are going to um, outpace radiata by a two to one margin. So I think that's quite quite interesting. And I think it shows that um, people are viewing the, the role of, of trees in the landscape in a different way now than they would have a generation ago, or maybe even just a few years ago. So I'm going to end my presentation here, um, except to say that I am frequently asked for the report. And there is no the report. This year's survey had 336 variables in it, and I just showed you 15 of them, mostly by industry. We can do the same thing by region or district or age or gender or risk profile or whether they have a successor in place or whether they believe in climate change. You can find more than 70 figures on our website, but if you have a hypothesis that you'd like to test, please contact us. The Survey of Rural Decision Makers is a resource that's meant to be used by policymakers uh, and scientists, as well as the farmers and foresters and growers themselves. Nam uh, Nihi Nui, I'm very happy, happy to take questions at this point. Thanks, Pike. That was obviously a very thorough 
presentation because so far we don't have any questions in the question box. So um, we could end it there or we can give you just a couple of minutes to um, quickly type in a question into the chat box and uh, we can put that uh, to Pike. Yes, here they come. Um, John Innes has asked uh, how how you think, Pike, that the Billion Trees campaign could be more effective? That's an interesting question, John. I think it's probably a question that's better uh, handled by some of the MPI folks that are on the line right now. Um, I think that, um, that said, I, I, I think that um, promoting the program more could be, um, could be uh, quite useful because there are some people that are saying that financial um, concerns are are preventing them from planting trees um, and um, and I think that, that if that's the hindrance that that's what the, the program is there for. Thanks Pike. Um, a, a little bit of a broader question here now. Um, how was the land use identified prior to the survey and uh, a bit of a, an insight into how the survey was done? Yeah, sorry, can you just repeat the first of the questions, Christine? I think actually there's two questions there. So let's yeah. um, let's deal with the first one. How mm -hmm. was the land use identified prior okay. to the survey? Um, right, so in the survey itself, um, land use, it, we actually asked people about all the different types of land, land use on their farms. And so um, many New Zealand, most New Zealand farmers, in fact, aren't only doing one thing. We don't have arable farmers that are only doing arable farming. They do arable and a, part, a bit of forestry and they might have some chickens or pigs as well. Um, so we ask about all the different land uses and then we ask people to identify what their primary industry is. Um, and so when the results are, are shown for sheep and beef farm, farmers or for dairy farmers, those people would also have maybe a bit of forestry or um, some other, other things on the side. Does that answer that question? I think that's uh, that's a good answer. Okay. Um, you focused on forestry and planting. Was there yeah. anything that stood out from other parts of the survey? Um, thanks. That's a great question. Um, there's a lot of things that stood out um, in other parts of the survey. Um, we asked questions about um, climate change and people's expectations around future climate, and also what people are doing in anticipation of future climate. Um, and we're seeing more interest in uh, adaptation and preparation than we had in the past. I thought that was uh, quite an interesting result. Um, we've done quite a lot of work on biosecurity and how people are viewing biosecurity on their farm. And we've seen a real switch from people um, thinking that biosecurity was sort of less important to something that they're gonna focus on more over the coming years, especially um, those in, in the dairy sector who had problems with uh, M. bovis or, or who knew people who had problems with M. bovis. So I think that uh, biosecurity is one of the really um, interesting things that, that's emerging uh, as well. Okay, and now back to a, a, uh, a forestry question. Uh, do you know what the negative perceptions of tree planting are? And Venice um, at FOA is interested in that. Yeah, thanks, Denise. I, I actually don't um, I don't know what that is apart from the media reports that I was reading uh, a year or so ago about um, people that were concerned about losing um, losing one way of life to change for another way of life, and there were there was just some negative press around that. Okay, and and now into some of the the native planting. Um, from the survey, can you tell if the interest in planting kanuka and manuka and other indigenous um, species uh, is just about planting, or did we look at uh, um, allowing reversion? Ah, that's a great question. Um, no, that those results that I was presenting was just about planting, and um, we do have some. Um, questions about reversion in the survey, and I didn't present those today. Um, but we do know that about uh, two thirds of commercial foresters, uh, foresters, farmers, and um, 
and growers do have some land on their uh, some part of their land that's not allocated to um, to strictly commercial activities. And so that might be things like riparian areas, or it might be allowing areas of native bush just to restore because because it's good for the environment. Okay, we've probably got time for two more. So I'm just going to um, try and segue into a question I think that follows from what Pike was just talking about. Um, did we try to identify where trees were being planted on the land, i.e. to protect waterways or gullies from erosion? And, um, oops, I've lost the rest of that question. I think that's enough. <laughs> Um, yeah, I didn't present that in, in the results today, but we do have a sense of, of where some of that tree planting is happening. We know that um, of the two-thirds of commercial farmers, foresters, and growers that I mentioned earlier um, that have some, some land that's not used for commercial purposes, we know that about a third of them have um, areas that are being used for um, riparian buffers, um, for example. And uh, we also know that the uptake of tree planting for erosion control is, is a really important driver of tree planting um, with lots of farmers um, becoming increasingly interested in, in that over the last couple of waves of the survey. Okay, um, one last big question. Was there any indication from the survey that sustainable forestry management practices were not be, being fully implemented? or if there was limited awareness around this? Uh, that's an, an interesting question. Um, the questions on forestry, including many of those um, that I presented today, were developed in conjunction with, uh, with the forestry industry. My sense um, is that we don't have, um, I'm not sure that we have great data on what's happening at the, at the individual forest level, but we do have sort of a a big picture of what's going on. And in my sense is that um, compliance with good practices is reasonably high um, and and that um, that foresters are are doing a, a good job. That's great. Um, Okay, we've got a lot of comments and a lot of questions coming in and, and I just want to reassure everybody that we will um, respond to you directly or um, in, in a collective response to some of these questions. Um, I've got one final one. Are there plans to spend more time and money informing farmers of the wider uses of trees on farms? That's a good question for uh, the, the folks at MPI. <laughs> okay, um, the, there have been a few questions that have uh, asked also about some of the other topics in the survey of rural decision makers. So I just want to reiterate that you will receive a link to all the published results from the survey. Um, they are just summaries and they're there to, to help inspire you to ask some of the deeper questions that you might uh, want to ask of, of this data and you're welcome to get in touch with either Pike or myself on that. Um, we will come back to you on, um, on those questions. I'd like to say uh, a thank you to Pike for a fantastic uh, presentation. That was uh, really interesting. Um, a nice segue into the biosecurity topic that I know is covered in the 2019 survey uh, fairly extensively. Um, and next week we won't be running a link online seminar, but what we will be running is a series of webinars on, on biosecurity topics in a format that we call the biosecurity bonanza. So I will let you know about that. Uh, I know that that will be of interest to, to some of you. So I'd like to say uh, thank you to everyone for joining us. It's great to have you here. And we look forward to catching up with you again at our next webinar series. Thanks.